Genesis tonight. Genesis. Last week we sort of got introduced to Noah. Saw some wonderful Bible truth. Some commandments that God had made regarding judgment. And so this evening, I'd like just kind of look at a little bit of the life of Noah. Brother Chris isn't going to know what happened with Noah because he has to go. But uh, you fill him in on it. <laughs> He'll only know what they taught in Sunday school, and they lied in Sunday school. <laughs> they, you ever see the, the picture depicted, you know, with people floating and trying to get in the ark? I just can't find anybody trying to get in the ark anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. You study and you look and you search for it. You find out they didn't want to be in the ark, and that's why they were outside it. But... Uh, Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth, of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah in the ark, the male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Father, help us tonight as we look at an important account in the Scripture that helps us to understand both our earth Father, that helps us to understand judgment. And Lord, more than anything else, helps us to see your mercy and see our need to respond to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot of detail in this text of the Scripture. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, this is one of these things that you could write an encyclopedia out of. This really is an encyclopedia in a couple of sentences. And by the way, the rest of the Scripture in many places offers commentary on this portion of the scripture. It gives us a lot more to say about it, but unfortunately, for sake of time, and it's just because we sang too long, not because I preached too long, uh, unfortunately, for sake of time, we can't look at everything this evening that we could look at. But one of the themes that we have found as we have studied through Genesis is that God is merciful, and I want to just bring out that theme as we look at Noah this evening. We look at the greatest judgment that has ever happened up till this time on the earth. You see, the Genesis flood was the greatest judgment ever. There has ever been in such a great judgment that God said, I will never judge in that same way again. And so one of the things that we always need to look at in judgment is God. We need to look at God. When you see judgment, Christian, the thing that will help you to be able to deal with harsh, in particular, judgment, the thing that will help you to deal with it is God. Uh, one of the things that we pointed out last week was the character of God. Brother Al reminded me about it this morning, and it's something that I've been thinking about uh, recently, just meditating a little bit on, and that is that uh, there is nothing, uh, nothing about God that is that is extreme. God is not extreme. Uh, God is holy, extremely holy. So there's nothing about God that's that's radical or that's extreme. But when we begin to relate to God, when God says, "Be ye holy," for I am holy, that's an extreme statement for us from our perspective. Nothing extreme about God. But you see, God is, God's holy character and His nature is the essence of everything that He is. And what is so startling to us is how different from us that holiness makes Him to us. See, many individuals think that they could just go to God as they are, and they think they ought to be able to just have a casual uh, approach to God and to the things of God in spiritual matters. And the reason that they'll have that, that careless attitude oftentimes is because they really don't have a grasp of how holy God is. See, if you'd ever met someone who'd never sinned, uh, you'd have a little bit of an idea, but you've never met anyone like that before. 
If you've ever seen somebody who'd never wronged anybody before, you'd have a little idea of what God is like, but you've never seen anyone like that before. If you've never seen someone who was infinitely merciful, who was just uh, completely selfless in their mercy. See, even when we're merciful, merciful, oftentimes we're selfish in our mercy. Oftentimes the, the literally our being merciful is for a selfish reason, even for the best of reasons. Uh, selfishness isn't always wrong in this context or in this, in this area. See, uh, if you're merciful because the Bible says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, that's a selfish reason, but it's a good one. You see. Hey, listen, I want, to, I want to obtain mercy, and so therefore, I'll be merciful. But God gives mercy for reasons that we cannot comprehend. You see, God, God doesn't need anyone's mercy, and yet He's merciful. And that's something you can't relate to. And as I said before, God is extremely different than us. He, see, He's not extreme. He's who He is. But when He says, be ye holy, as I, therefore, as I am holy, that's an extreme statement. That's a major contrast between what we are and what He is and who He is. And so, as we look at God in Genesis, Christian, one of the things that is important for us to get a grasp of is a picture of who He is and to look at judgment. And as I begin by saying, it will help you, Christian, if you struggle with judgment. If you struggle with justice, it will help you if you'll look at God in judgment. If you'll look at God in justice. And by the way, if you're one of those that struggles with mercy... You struggle with God's mercy, and you say, God, why did you allow? Well, the reason God allowed is because of His mercy. I'll tell you that. that you can just jump right to the point on that and just apply it and figure out how God's merciful and for what reason He's merciful. But the reason God allows is because He's merciful. I'll, I'll tell you, you just say, God allowed it because, and you could just say He's merciful, plug that in, and it'll fit. God is merciful. And so when we look at God in judgment, we see God in mercy, but sometimes God's mercy... It, it violates our sense of justice, doesn't it? Sometimes we say, well, God, you shouldn't have been merciful to that individual because why? Well, because they violated me. They've harmed me. They've done an injustice against me. And by the way, I'm not making light of that this evening. I'm talking about gross injustice here tonight. I'm talking about the wreck your life kind of injustice. The kind of thing that leaves, uh, leaves wives without husbands, that leaves children without parents, that leave individuals unable to cope in any relationship in their lives. I'm talking about wrecking you kind of situations. I'm not making light this evening. I'm serious about this. But one of the things that will help you, Christian, when you begin to look at the character of God is it will help you to understand His mercy. Now, as we look at Noah this evening, we last week saw this, this uh, serious, this serious uh, turn of events, if you will, or serious trend at the time where the sons of men saw the daughters of, or I'm sorry, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And we find that these, this godly seed from the line of Seth intersperses or intermingles itself with the ungodly seed of the line of Seth. I'm sorry, of the line of Cain. And that, thank you, Earl. If you hadn't left, I might not have caught myself. Well, so they, they mingled themselves, and the result is not that holy rubs off on unholy, but the end result is that evil has rubbed off on good. And now there is no one that seeks after God but for an exception, and that is the man Noah. Now I want to look at Noah, and I want to look at some exception. And I want us this evening to note not only God's judgment, God's justice, God's righteous judgment, but I want us also to see this important, really preeminent or prominent thread of God's mercy. First of all this evening, I want to say to you that God had warned the wicked. God's warning to the wicked had been continually. When Cain sinned, God gave Cain a warning and a promise. He gave God bo or Cain both a warning and a promise. And when Cain's generations that followed after him began to do more wickedly than Cain himself had and began to, uh, if you will, become men of renown for their wickedness, they were warned of God. Keep in mind, up to the time of Noah, the generation of Adam are just really uh, two generations removed. It would almost be like uh, the, the individuals that my grandfather knew. So if I were to talk to my grandfather, he'd say, yeah, you know what? I knew Adam. I saw him. 
I saw the first man. Of course, we were relatives, but we're quite a few generations removed. Keep in mind from Noah, that was the scenario. That was the situation. Literally, Noah's grandfather would have seen Adam, and he could have talked to his grandfather about the first man. So Noah uh, probably wasn't an evolutionist. He probably wasn't somebody that said, well, I'm not sure if I believe in the creation account that first his granddad had seen the first man. And of course, not just his granddad, but all his granddad's peers, the people that were around. It wasn't a far removed situation. Noah was a believer in creation. He was a believer in God. And by the way, that's just a lie and a cop out. I, I don't have a lot of time anymore to uh, debate or argue with somebody that says they don't believe in God. By the way, I haven't met anyone in a while that really honestly says they don't believe in God. They're becoming few. I meet atheists, but I don't meet people that say they don't believe in God. Most atheists don't even say they don't believe in God anymore. It's just, there's a, they're changing. I don't know what's going on with the atheists. They're not what they used to be, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, men believe in God. They just do. They're born believing in God, and that's where I begin. That's the starting point. Anytime I'm going to share something with someone, I'm going to say, well, there is a God. Now, I may have someone say to me, well, who is God? I don't know who God is. They're all the religions of the world. There are all these uh, teachings, and every religion teaches something different. I think God's just a little mix of everything, or I just think that God is one of them, and He's not exclusive of the others, because how could you know who He is? And that's where we would disagree, and that's where we go to the Genesis account. We would begin to look at things that no other religion accurately records. No other religion takes you back to the first man. No other religion takes you back to the Creator. No other religion explains where sin comes from. No other religion explains uh, the plan that God had to redeem us from sin. No other religion has a God of mercy and a God of justice and judgment. And by the way, we're made just individuals. We have a justice system ingrained in us, built into us, so much so that the Bible says in Romans chapters 2 through 4, very, very specifically, that, that and, and really Romans 1 through 4, uh, teaches very specifically that we're born in knowing not only God, but we know His nature. And uh, we know that uh, even without the Gentiles, the Bible says, who don't have the law, who didn't have the Word of God, they're born knowing in their hearts good and evil. And they know there's a God. And so there's no question, there's no debate about whether or not there's a God, but some people do need to be introduced to Him. Some folks need to be introduced to Him. Now, God will introduce Himself if you won't help. I, I'm not one of those uh, that, that gets extreme and says, well, somebody will go to hell if, uh, if, if you're not willing to preach the gospel, God's got someone to preach the gospel, and he'll go to extremes to get it to a person who desires to believe it. But he will use a person, he will, will use his spirit, and he will use his word. I believe those three elements are always part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I do believe God will hold you accountable for not sharing the gospel with people even who receive it, but particularly for those who, uh, who did not receive it. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, not only for those who receive it, but also for those who do not receive it, who God wanted you to share it to because God's will is to save all men. Now, moving along this evening, we see, first of all, one of the things that I believe are important is, is a warning of judgment. This flood didn't catch people by surprise, much like oftentimes we think. The flood didn't keep uh, us, get, didn't catch the people by surprise. And interestingly enough, as we enter into the portion of the text which tells us who Noah was, the instructions that God had made with regard to the size, the dimensions, the means to build the ark. It is interesting that God does not mention the wicked really at all at this time. And it is just not mentioned. <laughs> we know they're wicked and we know God said, okay, Noah, get an ark. I'm getting you out of here. And then you don't really see a reference to the wicked men that are on the earth. We don't, we don't see them named. Uh, we don't find them dialoguing with Noah as men, men often said, you know, you ever see the pictures where people are mocking Noah, you know, and uh, you see him pestering and bothering him and trying to hinder his work. Uh, the fact is that Noah was doing his work, and it seems, from all I can tell in the Scripture, he was largely uncontested. I don't think anyone really bothered him much about building the ark. You don't find it in the Scripture. I've looked for it and been able to find it. I've seen it in the pictures, like I said, for, from the Sunday school curriculum. But, you know, they... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My wife's a Sunday school teacher. She's going to say, you'd be nice to the Sunday school teachers now. Well, they need to do, do their homework before they make the pictures, don't they? You've never made a picture of people floating around, have you? No, so she's innocent, so we don't have to worry about it. Anyway, uh, but those, those folks aren't mentioned much, but Noah's mentioned quite a bit. We're introduced to him. Matthew chapter 24 is an important passage of Scripture that gives us a parallel to Noah in his day. So let's go ahead and jump there. Matthew chapter 24, go all the way over the New Testament and you're... In your Bible, Matthew chapter 24, this is a wonderful passage of Scripture that's being maligned by many so-called fundamentalists at, at, uh, days of uh, recently. But in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus has just 
uh, just given his indictment on Jerusalem and and has just said what's going to happen to her. He talked about her, the warnings that he'd given to Jerusalem by sending prophets, wise men, scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from sin from city to city. Well, down in chapter 24 and verse 3, the disciples came to him, as the Bible says, as they sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. So the disciples asked a twofold question. They said, Jesus, when are these things going to be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? So there are uh, several different questions asked in Matthew chapter 4. When are these things going to happen? And specifically, uh, what's going to be the sign of your coming, and what's going to be the sign of the end of the world? Well, Jesus is answering that question. And in, in verse 34, the end of the answer, Jesus said, I, Verily I say unto you, or truly I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. And so, of course, the generation would have been inclusive of the Apostle John and the near time events. And we know that around 70 AD that Jerusalem was sacked, the temple was thrown down and destroyed, as Jesus had just recently prophesied. And so those things that were withholding the Son of Man from coming were not yet done. And so uh, Jesus said in verse 35, though, he said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And then he goes on to say something uh, that is very, very simple truth and very, very profound and ought to help people theologically if they're struggling with regard to order of events. Verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day? Well, what was the question? Genesis, or I mean, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. What shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So the question is, when are these things going to happen? Well, uh, the Bible says nobody knows. They don't know when the, when the, what the signs of Jesus' coming are. Why? Because everything that is necessary for the Holy Spirit of God to accomplish or to do has already been fulfilled. There is nothing that is hindering the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, it's done. It's happened. And the next thing that's coming is Jesus. And so uh, the Bible says, here's how it's coming, though. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So here's what will be happening when Jesus comes. I'll tell you what will be happening. People will be carrying on doing what they do and not looking, not watching. Verse 38, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So what were people doing while Noah's building the ark? They're doing their thing. They're living their life their way without any kind of expectation that God has judged. Uh, incidentally, uh, well, we'll, go, we'll jump there in just a minute. I'll, I'll keep forgetting ahead of myself just a little bit. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And then verse 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord hath, doth come, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known and what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Be, therefore be ye also ready, for such an hour as you think, not the Son of Man cometh. And so anyone that thinks that they know when Jesus is going to come is full of nonsense. Amen. You're full of nonsense. You don't know when Jesus is going to come. You're just supposed to expect Him. I, <laughs> I've had something kind of similar to this. Not exactly the same. But uh, I've had a bit of an antagonist tormenting and tempting, or uh, not tempting me, but tormenting me for the last couple of weeks and as a rodent. And uh, he, he's, he's been personally bothering me. Um, and he's not anymore, by the way. He's been removed. He's been taken out. But I had one for the last couple of weeks. And, you know, you, you think it's like a little ninja. It was a rat. It was like a little ninja rat, you know. And uh, I, the, probably the trickiest, smartest rodent I've ever run into. Most time I've been able to take him out pretty easily. But this guy was just a rascal. Here's what he did. Uh, my screen had, had uh, been broken a little bit on my back patio or pulled out just a little bit. And... Um, I woke in the middle of the night and saw him scurrying across the floor, and so he had come in that little spot. And so what I did was I went out and I repaired the screen, which you'd think would be an intelligent thing to do. And so what he did was chewed a hole in the screen because he felt as though he had a right of entry there, and I closed it up, and so he opened it back up. And so I blocked it off, and he chewed a hole on the other side of the screen. And I didn't give him access to the house, and so he made holes in our bathroom window. He made a hole in our bathroom window, came in that way. So I closed the window before I fixed the screen. I figured I'll kill the rat, then I'll fix the screen. You know, well, he, he chewed a hole through the other side of the window. Closed that, he chewed a hole through our bedroom window. That little rascal felt as though he had the right of entry to our house. Now, here's the other thing that got me about him. I'd set traps where he last was, and uh, he'd never go there again. He never struck the same place twice. 
I mean, he'd get me here, he'd get me there, he got me once in the laundry room, he attacked in the laundry room, he attacked once on the, on the kitchen table, he attacked once uh, on the kitchen floor, attacked once in our bedroom, attacked once in the bathroom. I mean, he would just come in different spots and places and uh, steal different things. I mean, he, he got a chapstick tube, and I mean, this little guy was really tormenting me. Well, he wasn't predictable. He'd show up, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, almost get him at like 3 in the morning, and then uh, the other night when I actually did get him was like 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. And so uh, he did finally come in, <laughs> came in one of his old holes, and I'd had traps strategically placed, and he'd set them off and, and not get caught. But I got him, and he was gone. So I know a little bit about this watchman thing. You ask my wife, uh, I hadn't been sleeping very well. Why? Because I've been wanting to kill that little devil. <laughs> That's why. And so in the slightest movement, we sleep with our windows open, the slightest movement I hear, I'm up and I'm out with my flashlight shining around. See, if I got a glimpse of him, he'd be a goner. I'd dig him out or chase him down or wherever he went to. I, he'd come out, I guarantee you. Uh, but I couldn't get a glimpse of the little rascal. He, that little rat kept hiding everywhere. And so if I'd known when he was going to come, I could have set up. I could have waited for him, but he never attacked in the same time twice. He never attacked the same place twice until he made the mistake he'll never make again. And so, <laughs> at the end of the days, uh, so I've been celebrating the last week. If, I, if I'm especially happy and well-rested, you know why now. Because I've been sleeping at night instead of chasing the rat. <laughs> but I got him. He's gone. I patched up my screens, and last night there was no screen eating. So, uh, he, he must have been the lone culprit. Anyway. That's the idea that's here. If you knew when the Son of Man was going to come, then you'd just wait until it's time for the Son of Man to come, and then you get ready and go at the time he's going to come. And the idea here is that you don't know when he's going to come, so be always ready. Because that's what the verse, verse 42 says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord cometh. So that's the application for a Christian. Now let's apply it to our text this evening before it gets too terribly late. So what we find, if you go back to Genesis chapter 7, uh, or, or uh, is that where we started off this evening? I don't think so. We, Genesis. Yes, Genesis. Okay. Yeah, Genesis chapter 7 is where we're at. Okay, so if you go back to Genesis chapter 7, one of the things that you're going to find is that there is a warning of judgment. The warning of judgment, according to Matthew chapter 24, was that Noah was building an ark. Noah was building an ark. You say, Pastor, all those people in the world, they couldn't have fit on the ark. Well, they could have built an ark too. You see, Noah was building an ark. That's one of the things that we have to remember. See, uh, the godliness was not a mystery to the ungodly. Seeking after God, offering sacrifice to God, finding grace in the eyes of God was not a mystery to the ungodly. It was rejected by the ungodly. See, the warning of judgment uh, was, was every time somebody died. People say, why'd they die? Well, because Adam sinned. And you'll die too. And if you don't turn to God, you'll die in your sin. See, every person knew that. It's not as though people say, well, who's God? And how do we know that God's going to judge? It's not a mystery. And all the time you've got Noah, and you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You have Noah's wife, and you have the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons. And they're living different than everybody else. You see, they had light. Uh, Noah... Uh, Noah's family with Shem, Ham, and Japheth are not busy in life with eating and drinking and making merry. They're busy building an ark. Why? Because there's a flood coming. There's a judgment coming. And interestingly, while they're build, busy building the ark, everyone else is busy doing something else. And it's interesting as well, and it's important that we understand this, that when the rain came... When God had the, the clean beasts go by twos, and he had seven of every kind of the clean beasts, and one set of every unclean beast all go up into the ark, people saw it. This is not a mystery. This is not what's happening here. Noah lived on the same earth everyone else lived in. He rubbed shoulders with others. He came from somewhere. He had family. He had people that were his associates. And they knew that Noah was doing something different. And even when animals started going on the ark, everybody kept on doing what they were doing. And you know, it's always been true about judgment. Hey, it is not the eminence of judgment that turns people to repentance. It's a response to God's mercy. And as the floods are coming up, here, God has shut the door on the ark. And God has said to those individuals, the door is shut. The waters are coming, the door is shut. But we don't find anyone crying out to God and asking to receive His mercy. 
You know what's interesting? You say, Pastor, well, they were probably floating and trying to hold on. They were probably trying to figure out a plan to survive it. I don't question that at all. But you study Revelation when you find God's great hand of judgment and you find no one repenting. <laughs> you don't find anybody turning to God. You just have them in the rebellion just more angry and more angry with God and less willing to accept His judgment. You know, sometimes don't we think like the rich man in hell? That if they had a sign, if they just had a sign... Well, then they would probably turn and repent. God, send back Lazarus that he could dip, or uh, that he could, so he could tell my brothers. And, and God said they have Moses and the prophets. And before the flood, I could see people saying, hey, God, why didn't you warn us? And God said, you had Noah. You had Noah. Noah was the man of God that preached in his generation the judgment of God, and people didn't respond to it. Response to God's hand of judgment is always, always, always a choice. It's a decision that individuals make. And they made a decision to be judged. And by the way, Christian, don't kid yourself. Don't fool yourself. If God judges you, it'll be, because it'll be your choice. Get this. Get this. Understand this. We, we, we sometimes don't think all the way through this. No person is ever judged on God's, by God's choice. Any person who God has ever judged, God has not made the choice to judge them. Did you know that? God's not weak. He does, he's not, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I have to judge this one or not. I think I will. I'm not saying that at all. God will judge. But God judges those who do not respond to His mercy. God will judge those who do not respond to His mercy. But every person has a choice to respond to God's mercy. Hey, no one will ever stand before God and say, well, God, I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> I wanted to receive mercy, but I just wasn't strong enough. I just couldn't act out in faith enough. Nobody's strong enough to receive God's mercy. It's a choice. God, I need your mercy. God never brings anyone to Him for judgment who is somehow innocent based upon their choice or based upon their lack of choice. A Christian, same is true for chastisement. Same is true for chastisement. See, chastisement is Christian judgment. It's judgment for a believer. And if God chastises you, it will be because you chose to be chastised. That's why. If you get spanked by God, if God has to deal with you and He has to teach you a thing or two to get you right, it's because you made a choice to go there. <laughs> Parents, is it good enough of your children? Well, I just couldn't help myself. Is that good enough for you? <laughs> no. What you say is, hey, I'm telling you, don't. If you do, here's what will happen. Now they got the choice, don't they? Don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't go there. If you do, here's what will happen. And when they make the choice, did you decide to judge them? Well, I think I'll decide to judge them. No, you made, you, you made the judgment before they ever de decided they were going to receive it. But when they made the choice to sin, they made the choice to receive the judgment that goes with it, you see. When men choose to re reject God's mercy, they make a choice to be judged by God. And so it's no surprise, really, once they've made their choice, it's no surprise that we don't find them hanging on to the ark. Is it? Why? Because they'd already made their choice. They'd already made their decision. They made their mind up, and God said, okay, I'm ready to judge. Now I want to point out something else that's important for us to understand. Uh, <laughs> there weren't very many folks making the right choice. There weren't very many folks making the right choice. Now, it's interesting in the days of Seth that the Bible says men became, began to call on the, uh, the name of the Lord. But in the days of Noah, men weren't calling on the name of the Lord with the exception of Noah and his family. Okay, and that brings us to another bit of application that's important for us to grasp here this evening. Isn't it wonderful that Noah's sons did make the choice? Isn't it wonderful that Noah's sons made the choice? You say, Pastor, well, it's all random chance. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You see, Christian, uh, and by the way, children, get this. You're not going to be able to stand before God and point out the lack of what your parents have done as though it's some sort of, some sort of reason why you should escape judgment. You can receive God's mercy on your own. But parents, you can find solace, you can find comfort in that if you teach your children to love the Lord, they'll receive God's mercy. Hey, listen. I believe this, and I believe it with all my heart, so I'll go ahead and say it. I believe it would be a wicked for you to have children if you thought they might not get saved. It would just be wicked. 
I can't conceive of the notion of a person having children with the idea that they'd burn in hell for eternity. If you think, well, pastor, you know, you just got to take your chances. You don't have a very good grasp of what hell actually is. And uh, were I a parent, if God had given me uh, that choice, I'd say I'd rather not have children. That's why I don't have children. But I wouldn't say uh, I'd rather not have children. I know my kids would go to hell. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right. Well, you could go home and believe that. That's a funny one to believe anyway. Pastor doesn't have kids because they'd go to hell <laughs> if he did. <laughs> well, they would be like me. And so, uh, anyway, that might be judgment in and of itself. Who knows? Anyway, anyhow, moving along then, as a teacher I used to have would say, uh, <laughs> you oughtn't to have children if you believe that. And the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of comfort in that Shem, Ham, and Japheth got on the ark. A lot of comfort. It didn't mean that their children didn't mean that their children would be godly. I like what Brother Will Rice says when he comes here. He talks about the family a lot, and he ought to. I I asked the Rices to talk about family because they've got one of the best families I've ever met, and so they're good people to talk about family. It's always good to have people that are doing things the right way, give advice and counsel and preach on it because evidently they're right about it because it works. Good theology works. And their theology is sound enough that, that I'd have them uh, teach on family all day long because they're solid about it. But Brother Will Rice says, you know what? He says, I believe, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. He says, but I'm not so naive as to think that my children could not turn out bad. He says, my children could turn out badly if I am a poor parent. He says, if I, if I, don't, do my, if I don't do right by my children, they'll turn out poorly. Good chance. God may be merciful to them but they could turn out badly. And uh, we oughtn't to make any kind of, uh, oughtn't to make any bones about that. You know, if we can't have some confidence about some things you know, that the Word of God preaches and teaches, and it, well, first of all, our theology is just not going to line up very well. If you, if you don't believe what the Bible says, then it'll come out in your practice and, and you'll fail in the very thing in which is most important to succeed. And I believe the greatest responsibility that God gives anyone is the responsibility of teaching children to love the Lord. And Noah did that and did a good job of it. His children got saved. And they got on the ark. That's the evidence that they received the mercy of God. They were on the ark. Okay, so now I want to look at a couple of more things that are here in this text that we don't want to pass over just because they're not just neat, but they're important. God's very specific with time. Uh, very, very specific with time. Uh, Noah was 500 years old, the Bible says in verse 32. And then in verse 11, the Bible says, in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, uh, the seventh day, teenth day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And so, uh, you ever think about how interesting it is that God gave the calendar date for the flood? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, it happened approximately so many, thus and so many years ago. Hey, had it happened on this day of the month. That's pretty specific, isn't it? I mean, God's specific about times and dates and places. And God's Word's very specific about it. And then if you, if you study down and you read through chapter 7 and read through chapter 8, you come down to verse 13 of chapter 8, or really verse 3 is kind of a beginning of it. We see the waters return from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Now we remember the rain, but we don't remember that Noah was in the ark with the rain coming, or that the waters are coming up, actually rising for 150 days. So it's quite possible that these are 150 days of judgment, if you think about it. It's quite possible that there are individuals that have clustered together on a high point of land. See, th this deluge that came, it wasn't all of a sudden, instantly, the world was destroyed. Mark this, note this, friend, this judgment was 150 days worth of judgment. Many times we think, yeah, it just happened, you know, they all drowned, you know, in a day it's all over and done with. No, people are running to the high points of the ground. You ever seen a flood? I've seen quite a few of them. It's interesting what happens when there's a flood. When it happens in the Everglades, the alligators get really happy because they can eat the raccoons out of the trees. <laughs> they can have anything they want. They just swim up and here's, here's a raccoon, he's marooned, there's a tree out in the middle of nowhere, and the alligator goes, rump, and there's nowhere for him to go. And they can eat anything they want to. And uh, you ever see a flood? You see that it goes up and up and up, and the highest point of land is where every living being goes, man and animal alike. Uh, it, a fire and a flood are both similar with the response of animals. If there's a flood coming in, you'll see uh, as, as, a flood, as flood waters are coming up, you'll see all the animals together, and it's interesting, they all get along. 
They don't know it. None of them, you know, nothing's trying to stop and snack, if you will. So here's a squirrel. He's running, and right next to him is a bobcat. They're both running. Why? Because they're running for their lives. They're trying to save their little hide, and they're not interested in destroying any other hide. And so I imagine this the way it was before the flood. Here are all the animals, and they're running to a spot, and all the people are running to a spot, and occasionally someone will get trampled because the spot will get too small. But I imagine it's getting pretty desperate in these days of judgment. Here are people, and there's, there's 10 foot of ground left and 100 people to stand on, and it's pretty rough. And uh, pre everybody's trying to pull the whole survival of the fittest, and so the, su the fittest survived for until 150 days. And then there was nothing left. Nothing left to float on. And by the way, if you can imagine the world being covered in a flood and the current and that sort of thing, uh, nothing small would have floated. You ever been out in a serious wave? And by serious wave, I mean four foot or higher. <laughs> Try going out in a four foot wave and holding onto a log sometime. It's nigh impossible, especially when it's a driving when it's a driving wave. In other words, a wave on top of a wave on top of a wave. You know, growing up in Kansas, we'd be on some of the larger lakes there. Yes, there's water in Kansas. Yes, there are lakes. Uh, but growing up in Kansas, I always have to, to say that because people don't believe it. We have lakes that are 15 miles across in Kansas. How do you like that? Anyway, uh, you, you, you'd be out and there'd be two-foot waves. And a two-foot wave was more dangerous than a six-foot wave in the ocean. Why? Because a two-foot wave on the lake was, was created not from current, uh, not from a stream. It was created by wind. When wind would be strong enough to build a two-foot wave, it'd build another one right behind. So you got bam, 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 and boy, you get your boat sideways on it. One starts coming over, and another, another, another. You're you're down way quicker than you would be in a six-foot wave in the ocean. That's why the Gulf Stream's so dangerous because you can get a wind crossing a current. And you get those waves right on top of each other. Well, I imagine the waves would have probably been, uh, you know, tsunami kind of waves. I imagine they would have been tidal kind of waves. And when they came in, it wasn't you know grab a hold of something and float. Nobody floated. 150 days of judgment, and it was over. Everybody was judged, man and animal alike. Um, I suppose if somehow, by some, by some means, someone had managed to hold on to survive very long, how long could you float when there's no dry land for uh, the, the rest of a year? See, we see four seasons are passed here, and now a whole year has come by, a year of this judgment. 150 days for the judgment to be enough that nobody could escape it, then 150 days to finish it off and nothing is left alive except for what's on the ark. And that's the nature of the judgment. I don't know if you ever really studied that or looked at it, but I think that's something that's interesting to note. Then looking at more at dates and times, look at verse 13 of chapter 8. It came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month. So before this, in, uh, in chapter 8 and verse 11, in the 600th, year of Noah's life in the second month. So we're one month shy, if you will, from the 17th day there. Uh, we're one month shy of a full year in verse 13. And then we find in verse 14, in the second month on the 7 and 20th day of the month was well, the earth dried. And so we find an addition of 10 days, one year, 10 days. Then Noah was on the ark. So it wasn't 40 days and 40 nights. Most of you know that. Most of you know it was quite a little while. But it was a year and 10 days. That, that Noah was on the ark. And I imagine they were probably, you know, over their seasickness by that time, but they were likely ready to get off. That's a long voyage. I don't mind going for a long boat ride, but that's a long one right there. Uh, <laughs> that, that would do in any submarine sailor, I think. Yeah, those guys, it, it'd be too much, I think, even for them. Okay, some more, more areas that we see. I want you to see God's mercy. Go back with me now, if you will, to chapter 7. I'm going to throw out some things to you, and then, and, uh, then we might be done. Who knows? Jack, back to chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, speaking after Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons after them, they went in the ark. They and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So any breathing critter, in other words, the... Uh, ones that didn't breathe the breath of life would have been in the water. The, the, the only different ones that would have survived. The fish didn't have to come in the ark. They managed it all right with all the extra water. It just seemed like it gave them more habitat, probably a little more food with all the drowning critters around. They, they couldn't be too choosy, but there was probably plenty for them. Anyway, we find God's mercy. Isn't it interesting, don't you think? Yeah, according to chapter 7 and verse 14 and chapter 8 and verse uh, 20, the Bible says, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Isn't it interesting that God included both the clean and the unclean beast on the ark? Now, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think that if God is going to clean up the earth, He'd clean it up with the unclean beast as well? 
What do we need them for? What do we need them for? You ask. Well, we need them so we can see how merciful God is. That's why. See, every time you see an unclean beast and you think, what's he good for? I can't even eat him. <laughs> Remember, God's merciful. God's merciful. And that has some application to people, you know. Surely does. What in the world would God let someone like that live? Why would he even, why would he even make someone like that, a monster like that? I'll tell you why. He's merciful. That's why. He's merciful. And God spared the unclean beast who were innocent of the sin of man. They were cursed by the sin of man, but they were innocent of it, and God spared them. Why? Because he's merciful. By the way, I think that this helps if you if you take this as a character. Don't take it too far. Don't take it to mean a lot more than it says. But if you take it as a character study, and you know, I, I've met people that are so so nonsensical. They're so into this God sovereignly elects people to go to hell thing that they actually believe that God elects babies to go to hell. And uh, you know, God didn't even kill the unclean beast. He didn't even exclude the unclean beast on the ark. You think he sends he think he sends babies who are innocent to hell? I don't think so. It's not in the character of God. It's not in His nature. At all, and the Bible contradicts it in every way. There's no evidence anywhere that God ever sent a child to hell. Uh, there's evidence to the contrary of it. Although people who want God to be that kind of an evil God don't accept it and they don't like it. Truth is, there's evidence against it, but no evidence that God ever condemns the innocent. And so God's merciful to the innocent. We need to keep that in mind because it's part of His character and His nature. Don't worry about the innocent and whether or not God's going to be merciful to them. So many times we're worried that God's going to mess up and judge somebody or something that was innocent. And we're just worried, oh, you know, somebody's going to get judged and it's not even their fault. You know, God's just very merciful. It's just very merciful. Children of Noah, they had an advantage. They had an advantage because they had a father who called on God. But everybody else had Noah too. Don't you forget it. Everyone else had Noah too. They just didn't have his authority in their life. He, he didn't have the right in their family to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He couldn't say that about them. And by the way, Christian, this is why it's important. This is not a small matter, this matter of having a Christian home. It's not something we want to just pass lightly over. Hey, don't, don't take a chance on a non-Christian home. Don't gamble with it. Don't gamble with it. Uh, you know, many Christians marry, marry uh, saved people who are, who are linked in. They're tied into the world. They're hooked up with the world. Before you ever consider marriage to somebody, make sure that, make sure that you and your house are going to have the right to be separated from the world. You're going to get, get the tentacles of the world out of your home. You're going to be able to have the authority to be able to lead in that way if you're a husband. Don't take a chance on it. Hey, I know a lot of good Christian men. I know, I know a lot of men I went to school with, and, and uh, statistics are terrible in it. Actually, they're terrible in every Bible college. You have all these men that, that uh, believe that they have God's hand on them, calling them into full-time ministry, the pre gospel preaching ministry, whether it be an evangelist or a pastor. Uh, they, they believe God has placed His hand on them for those particular ministries and their calling. And then those fellows fall in love with a girl. You know, she wants to be a preacher's wife. Uh, <laughs> but she doesn't know that being a preacher's wife means that uh, you're going to have to love God and love ministry, and you're going to have to follow that husband wherever the Lord calls him to. And uh, she finds out it means moving away from mom and dad to go someplace and do ministry. And she says, I'm not leaving my mom and my dad. I, I know a fellow that I went to school with, and he married a girl, and she was all for, you know, the job that he got. But he went and got a good job as an assistant pastor for a for a preacher that I really feel like he was privileged to get to serve under and be mentored by. And his wife said inside of a year, she said, if you don't, if we don't go home, I'm leaving you. And so he had to leave his ministry in order to keep his wife. Well, friend, uh, that didn't show up. That didn't show up when it happened. <laughs> that didn't show up when it happened. It was there before that, I'll submit to you. you. say, Pastor, you can't know the hearts of anyone. God doesn't play games, Christian. God doesn't play games. And if you compromise in the area of what God wants for you and a spouse... If you just take a gamble and decide you're just going to marry anyone, you'll pay for it, and it'll cost you, and it'll cost you a Christian home. You can't have a Christian home without two people that are determined that they're going to have a Christian home. It just can't happen. It's not going to happen that way. And unfortunately, I'm sad to say, uh, all you can count on is God's mercy. And, and aren't you glad He's very merciful? Aren't you glad He's very merciful? But Christian, hey, listen, take warning. Take heed, because, because these are things, these are matters that all the time I see young people play games with. I see... I see young men and young ladies dating people they oughtn't to. They don't love the Lord like they should. They're not willing to serve God like they should. And if you think that somehow you can have a ministry without your spouse, you're fooling yourself. If your first ministry, which is your spouse, isn't for the ministry, you can't have ministry, period. That's all there is to it. 
It'll, you'll be shut down and that'll be the thing you have to deal with. Until that's dealt with, you can't move forward. So it's an important matter. Get it. Get it. Don't go there if you don't have to. I, I encourage people to marry the person God wants you to marry and don't marry the person God doesn't want you to marry. And there is a way you can know. Just don't do it. Don't, don't go messing there. If there's something wrong, don't marry them. So there you're exonerated, whoever you are. All right, let's move on. Seasons will come and go. Seasons will come and go. Look at this. God says in, as he, in verse 8, his response to Noah, Noah offered a, took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. I'm in chapter 8 and verse 20. And God said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, <laughs> you can't tell when God's going to judge. You can't tell when God's going to judge, and there's a reason for that, isn't there? That ought to be common sense to us. Listen, you knew when God was going to judge, you'd just get right right before. Just go ahead and eat and drink and be merry and get right right beforehand. But the truth is, you can't tell when God's going to judge. More than that, though, I... Uh, <laughs> You couldn't tell when God was going to judge the whole earth. There's going to be a major judgment, but God made Noah a promise. His promise was, I'm not going to do that kind of a judgment again. And you can be sure that you're going to have every year. <laughs> do you know that I haven't lain awake at night? I lay awake at night listening to rats and trying to catch them. But I don't wait, lay awake at night wondering if summertime is going to come. I don't wonder if wintertime is going to come. Now, I'm not always sure when it's here in South Florida, but there's places I could find it if I needed to, just to be sure. It always comes. Summer always comes. Spring always comes. Seed time and harvest always comes. Always does. And the reason for that is because God is not going to judge the earth again. <laughs> I don't worry about the comets. Pastor, do you know if a comet were to hit the earth, it could knock it out of orbit? And all of a sudden, we'd get away from the sun and we'd all freeze to death or burn to death, depending on which direction we go? Don't worry about it. God says it's not going to happen. That's part of his promise, his covenant promise. Wonderful promise, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God guarantees that you don't have to worry about the events of this life. They'll take care of themselves. And he gave us four seasons and said that uh, they would be a guarantee. You say, Pastor, well, those four seasons are because before that, they just always had a springtime harvest kind of a season. They didn't have the, the, the extreme temperatures. Fine. Fine. But that's not the covenant that God made with Noah. God made the promise that you're going to have these seasons. They're going to be guaranteed. And that you're going to have, these are going to be the makeup of a year. These are the things that make up every year. You only have to count one to know when a year has come by. When you've been, you, when you've been so cold, you freeze to death outside twice. You know that a year has passed, and so it's not not rocket science. Well, so we're out of time. God gave gave in His covenant. He gave some promises. He reiterated man's purpose on the earth: be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air. And he goes on to talk about the things you can eat. Eat the flesh with the life thereof, but not the blood. And then in verse 6, we see God's promise of judgment. Whosoever sheddeth, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Pastor, I don't agree with capital punishment. I don't agree with capital punishment. I don't think it's right. You know, I just think that, you know, punishing in kind is just making a bully out of the person punishing. Well... First of all, you don't know more than God does. And second of all, God didn't give Cain capital punishment and it didn't really help anything. You ever think about that? In other words, God didn't execute Cain when he sinned and murdered his brother Abel. He deserved it. He deserved it. And so God established a new law to help us with wickedness. Capital punishment. Pastor, what do you think we ought to do to the extremely wicked? I'll tell you what we ought to do. Capital punishment. It's biblical. It's God's plan. It's God's way. Well, what if it happened to you? Well, then I deserve it. Same as if you did. That's all. God's plan works. It's His way. And that was God's covenant that He made with man. And of course, He gave us His covenant promise. He set a bow in the clouds. And I want to want you to think about this. And remember always to think the correct way or, or I'll be spying on you and know that you don't think right. Uh... <laughs> Next time you see a rainbow, just remember God's covenant promise. God said, I'll never destroy the earth again the way that I did this time. There's never going to be that great flood. I was watching one of my dad's city commission meetings on video a couple of weeks ago, and he, 
that somebody was talking about, you know, there could be an, a, a catastrophe and it'd be a great flood. And dad said, my dad said, he said, well, you, you can't really stave off every event that ever possibly could happen. There's a time when the whole world got covered in a flood. So if you're going to create a you're going to create a zone that's secure from a flood. It's not really possible. Well, if you know where it's at, you know, probably the highest mountain somewhere, but you know there's no oxygen there. And so you just as well take your chances and just look at the promise. I'm making jokes here. Probably uh, it's too late to make jokes. But <laughs> God's promise he'll never destroy the earth by flood again. And again, what are we finding these promises that God made? What do we find? Mercy. 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 God's merciful, Christian. Get to know His mercy. If you don't, you'll get to know His judgment. Get to know His mercy, because if you don't, you will get to know His judgment. And that's a choice that every person has to make. It's a choice that you need to preach to every person that you meet. Receive God's mercy, or you'll receive His judgment. Your choice. And your choice as a Christian. Father, we thank You for Your mercy. Lord, we wouldn't be so arrogant as to think that we are here and that we are recipients of your mercy because of any merit in us. But God, it's your character which sets you apart in your holiness from us. And we want to express our gratitude to your mercy and thank you for showing it to us and shedding it on us. Father, thank you for grafting us in and allowing us to be part of the olive tree when really we were just offcast and never belonged. But God, you've been merciful and we thank you for it. We praise you and thank you for the confidence that we can have of your continued mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.